Uh, I would like to be less definitive and more exploratory on this Al Gore statement that I find unbelievably shocking. He was on MSNBC, and he's talking about the human makeup. And I'm sorry, but I have heard this language before. Uh, This is the language of eugenics. Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger. This is... And uh, and uh, uh, what's his face? Uh, George Bernard Shaw. Get the George Bernard Shaw um, audio too ready, will you? Yeah. Um, if you don't know, the progressives are the ones who came up with eugenics, and you you have to excuse some of them in the in the early 1900s because science had just you know in 1870 1880. Um, uh, you had people like Edison saying there's no reason to wire everybody's houses with anything but DC battery uh, power, you know, uh, DC um, uh, electricity, because you'll never have anything in your house that is electric, really, except for lights. I mean, even Edison didn't see what was coming. Within 10 or 15 years, the whole world had begun to change. And now there was science, and that's where electric shocks came in. Let's do electric shock therapy. And you had Darwin, and all these things were happening all the same time. And Marx. So you had Nietzsche, Marx, electricity, um, uh, technology. Everything was changing and converging into one. So you had a bright beautiful tomorrow you had a beautiful better living through uh, eugenics i have the i have the books tomorrow or i mean next week we'll do a special show on this because i you have to know this history um and in one of them by the guy who i'm trying to remember his name shoot it's the phantom the phantom public is the name of the book by walter lippman walter lippman is extraordinarily um uh, loved by the um, uh, media. He is the father of modern media. He was one of the fathers of CBS and CBS News. Um, he was part of the Wilson administration. Really dangerous guy. Um, he helped put together the Council on Foreign Relations. And in his book called The Phantom Public, he talks about people who are just too stupid and they'll never get it, and they will never, they vote, and they think they're doing the right thing, but they just don't know, and it's because you because of genetics. Genetics just show that they'll just never get it, and they'll continue to push us into um, the background. But he, he talks about how eugenics and scientists are now looking to ways to build the perfect voter. And someday we'll be able to weed out these genetic flaws in people. And we'll have people who are all progressives. But in the meantime, what we're going to have to do is brainwash and trick some of these people. This was the great hope of the progressives during the Wilson administration and the Theodore Roosevelt administration. You know, from the turn of the century up until it was wildly discredited by the Germans. We also, I'll bring in next week, letters from the Nazis to the progressives in California saying, you brought all this progressive stuff over, you brought all this eugenic stuff. You guys, we can't thank you enough. May you never forget what you've done in Germany because you have now put the state on this track And the things that we're going to be able to do because of what you taught us scientifically will never be forgotten. Oh, that's true. I mean, we even have we even have signs that say never forget. They were responsible. It came. These ideas that happened in Nazi Germany came from the progressive movement in the United States of America, secondarily from the Fabian socialists. In England, it was a poison from the West that went East. And there are those who still believe it. We had a, um, uh, we told you a story of a big uh, lefty in Salon that wrote just last week that all, all men are not created equal. 
All life is not equal. She said, let's be honest. We all know that a baby is, uh, she said, when I was carrying my children, I always knew that was a baby in there. So let's stop this bogus argument. We all know it's a baby. Let's just be up front and let's use the real argument. All life is not equal. That goes against everything that Americans used to stand for. But David Barton gave me an extraordinarily wild fact. Does anybody remember last night? I I think it was 60% of the American people that voted didn't know that the Constitution was the supreme law of the land this last November. In exit polls, 60% didn't know. They, I mean, how do you win? How how does America survive if you don't even know, not, not know the Constitution, not know that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land? That is terrifying. So not all people are created equal. You now have the president, through executive order, um, doing studies on who should and who shouldn't have guns. He's demonizing anybody who's on the other side, saying there's something wrong and I will not have these people stand in the way of progress. He's co-opting and now controlling our doctors and our hospitals. They have a death panel. It wasn't in the health care bill. As we told you at the time, it was in the stimulus package. They're right now having a hard time putting, getting anybody to go on this death panel because those are the people who is going to decide who lives and dies. And if you have an attitude that not, not all life is created equal, if you are funding death camps by the name of Planned Parenthood, forget about your FEMA camp. Your death camp in America is Planned Parenthood, and you're funding it. When the world is going towards no value on life, and when your world is going towards a place where it's so egomaniacal, there is no one but them, no one but the individual, no one else matters. I want mine, Grandma. You had yours. I was promised this. When you have a world that is so intertwined, and in five years from now, you will not recognize our society. The beginning of the singularity is already here. The merging of man and machine is, the merging of reality and 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 total virtual reality but a reality you will not be able to tell the difference between Stu, do you remember when i said to you back in the 90s there's going to come a day where you won't believe your eyes because they'll be able to make any image on camera any picture it won't matter you could just and we're there now oh, would yeah. you agree yeah sure I'm telling you now, you will not be able to tell the difference between virtual reality and real reality sometime down the future, probably within the ten in the next ten years. That changes everything. All of this technology that is going on right now, do you know who's teaching ethics on technology? And now that's not a rhetorical question. We can't find anyone. They're not teaching ethics. When it comes to technology, they're not teaching ethics. And so now Al Gore comes out and he says on NBC, for all the world to hear, and if you know anything at all about eugenics, if you know about the early 20th century progressives, which Hillary Clinton said she is cut from that cloth, I am one of the early 20th century progressives, all eugenics, all Marxist wannabes just they're not marxist they just want the marxist utopia without the revolution that's the 20th century progressive early 20th century progressive and they're almost unanimously cheerleaders for eugenics and weeding out the weak if you know anything about that listen to what al gore just said 
the scientists now know that there is in human nature a divide between what we sometimes call liberals and conservatives and it gives an advantage you can speculate to the human species to have uh, some people who are temperamentally inclined to try to change the future and experiment with new things and others who are temperamentally inclined to say hey, wait a minute not too fast and when these natural tendencies are accentuated with political ideologies or for that matter religious factions mm -hmm. and the other divides that are sometimes used to, to, uh, for, for advantage, then it can get out of hand. Mm, can it? And then what do you do? So you are, you are born um, just only able to understand the future or dragging us back into the past. And then people will put a label on that. You'll either go into religion or you'll become a conservative well, if you're one of those that are holding us back, of course you'll go into religion. Yeah, or conservative. Yeah. Otherwise, you're a Democrat, a liberal, and you're an atheist. You're a scientist. Mm -hmm. Extraordinarily dangerous. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it. Maybe, I, maybe I've read too much history. I found the story, the, the study he's talking about. This is, it comes from New Scientist, uh, British Weekly Scientific Magazine. Uh, the title, Two Tribes, Are Your Genes Liberal or Conservative? Delves into the serious scientific research on the formation of political opinions. I remember us talking about this story when it happened because it talks about how conservatives are dogmatic, routine-loving individuals while liberals come across as free-spirited and open-minded. Well, that's um, how they come across, yes. Yeah. According to the, an emerging, uh, the emerging data, political position, positions are substantially determined by biology and can be stubbornly resistant to reason. These views are deep-seated and built into our brains. Trying to persuade someone not to be a liberal is like trying to persuade someone to not have brown eyes. We have oh, to let's, oh, maybe we should get <laughs> some twins. <laughs> uh, then it goes on, dogmatic types, more conservative. Uh, those who express interest in new experiences tended to be liberals. A much stronger link exists between political orientation and openness, which psychologists define as including traits such as an ability to accept new ideas, a tolerance for ambiguity, oh my oh my and gosh. an interest in different cultures. Oh my when these traits are combined, people with high openness scores turned out to be t almost twice as likely to be liberals. Openness? How do you describe liberals as open <laughs> to anything? They're not open they're not to open anything to, but their own you know, opinions. Can I tell you something? That's it. Penn Jillette is, and, and I, I'm sorry I keep talking about him, but I find him one of the most amazing men I know. He's a fascinating guy. Penn Jillette is just fascinating. When Penn Jillette and I first meet, met, and I'll tell you, I've said this to you over and over again. I really respect him, blah, 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 but I think he's a bigot. Old information. He's not. He is not. Penn wrote to me uh, last week, uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago, because we were we have these fascinating. I'd love to do a book just on our email exchanges. The Penn and Glenn letters, or the Glenn they and Penn are, letters. They are truly remarkable um, because I'm I'm trying to understand his point of view, and he's trying to understand my point of view. I think, and we're coming back and forth, and we have these just all day exchanges. I'm not kidding you. One of them was just on that guy in Florida that um, uh, was having sex. On pleasuring himself on a donkey, <laughs> not in a donkey, but right. on, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it started, 8 o'clock on a Saturday. At the end of the day, we just kept going back, you know, about, you know, 300 characters maximum and just keep going back and forth on it. Fascinating. At the end, I kind of joked with him. I said, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if we're closer or farther apart. I'm not really sure. I have to digest this whole conversation over a very long period of time. I said, but, you know, then again, I'm a guy who would never be invited to your house. Going back to a reference that he said about the second or third time I met him at CNN, and he said to me, um, you know, I said, you're fascinating. I'd love to get together with you sometime. And he said, I'd love to. He said, of course, you're never coming over to my house. And he was serious. He said, um, you know, because you're a religious freak. And he said, I'm never going to have you religious people over. He said, it's like, why would I put a poison in my house? And I was shocked. And I said, boy, I thought, I thought you were a lot of things, but I never thought you were a bigot. And he, he walked away. And we've always, we had a, for, for a while a, still a relationship, but it was a weird relationship. It was terse. He wrote to me and he said, I apologize that I have never told you this. 
He said, but you changed me. He said, yes, I used to be bigoted against religious people. He said, but you've changed me. I'm not. He said, I apologize for all of that, and I am sorry, and I am trying to fight uh, uh, my, my close-mindedness on anybody that I don't understand or I don't, um, I, I don't uh, agree with. He said, on all fronts. He said, so I apologize. And now he's become a really a big defender of people who are religious, even though he's not, and he doesn't understand it. That's an open-minded person. And I'm sorry, that is not, he doesn't call people enemies. That is not a liberal. That is not somebody who says, you know what, I, I'm somebody who's going to, um, you know, I've, I've, we've got to wipe these people out, or we've got we've to find out if we can. No. I respect them for who they are. Everybody is different. And as long as we all can play nice and I don't try to shut you down or call you names, you don't do that to me. We all live together. It's like a family. Just there's billions of us. You live in the house and you all try to get along, even though you don't agree with each other. We all try to get along. We don't try to wipe each other out. And I would never, as a dad, go and say to one of my daughters, well, genetically, you know, she's born like that. <laughs> she only believes those things, and she's going to fall into a religion, or she's going to fall into, you know, some. she'll fall in with some atheist. If I'm a conservative, she'll fall in with some atheist, or she'll fall in with some liberals because she was born that way, you know. Oh, my gosh. What are we turning into? Glenn Beck. You know, we're just talking about um, Al Gore basically saying that you are genetically inclined to be a conservative or liberal. I uh, I find this incredible. Um. Uh, he says, you know, people are, are born with either being leaders and science-minded and progressive-minded and they see the future, or you're born saying, wait, 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 no, let's don't. Let's, let's, I like things the way they are. Those kind of people usually can't produce enough potatoes to support themselves. Exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, Stu, read the thing. Show the thing you just showed me. He said, I've been saving this for a while, so the next time we did a eugenics thing. Read, read The War Against Children by Edwin Black. Horrifying. Uh, War, War Against, against the, the Weak. weak. War yeah. Against the Weak. Um, but it, it, it explains the progressive eugenic movement. Well, anyway. and George Bernard Shaw explained it pretty well. Yeah, listen to this. You must all know half a dozen people at least who are no use in this world. We yeah, all he, must know a, a half a dozen people at least who are of a, no use in this world. Who are more trouble than they are worth. Just put them there. And say, sir or madam, now we will be kind enough to justify your existence. So he says, so we all know at least half a dozen people that are of no use to, uh, to the world. Just sit them there and say, sir or madam, justify your existence. If you can't justify your existence, if you're not pulling your weight in the social group, then uh, clearly uh, we cannot use the big organization of our society uh, for the purpose so explain wow. your existence. Wow. And if you can't, then we can't use our organizations and our society <laughs> to keep you alive. I've heard that I don't know how many times. It's it's shocking horrifying. every time. That's George Bernard Shaw. Did you go to school and ever hear about George Bernard Shaw? He is loved. He is oh, a yeah. monster. I used to go to a diner and they have quotes on the menus, and one of the menu quotes is from this guy. Was it sir or madam? No, it was not. You stand there and justify your existence. <laughs> you know what? I would, love to, I, I would love to. I, I would love to be able to to have a uh, a diner like that and would just show the real quotes of these oh, people. So great. you would know. So it's on the menu and you just what? Mm. You got all the other quotes on the napkin. Margaret or, Sanger, yeah, George just all Bernard Shaw. Just so people knew who these people were. They You hear these names and you don't know. George Bernard Shaw. Oliver they Wendell Holmes. love him. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Horrible human being. Mm -hmm. uh, Jules Verne. 
not so great. Not so great. All because, and let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They'll never do this to the founders. Let's give the early progressives the benefit of the doubt. They didn't know. They didn't have the record of what this turns into every time. Massive slaughter. So when you're thinking, hey, maybe we can do with genetics, they didn't know. Yeah, they just had the questionable science, the uh, the fight against the traditions. They had all those things that we have now against uh, many of the claims made by progressives, but we don't have the end proof yet. Yeah, Still, they, you they're would... climate change guys. Mm-hmm. They're climate mm-hmm. change guys. Mm-hmm. They'd be the same guys who would say, you know what, climate change is real. We don't really have the science on that. Uh, you know what, just do it. Just do it, because we have enough. Well, they did, eugenics, because they had enough. And they didn't. And what happened was mass slaughter you would of think, people. Even though, even before the Holocaust, you would think that cleansing the race of impurities would have been a chilling concept even then. Wouldn't you? And to, it a, was to, to a luckily, normal human yeah. being, not I think to you, most people I don't think it was. So. Not, when you, not when you have it sanitized and cleaned up and you're like, no, this is just going to be better for all of us. You won't have any more dumb people. You won't have any more dumb people. You won't have any more. You won't have any more of them retards. You, know, the, you have to remember mm-hmm. that's they the words retard that they used at the time was yeah. not a bad word at the time. In fact, Stu had the better word, and they didn't think this was bad. We won't have any defectives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm taking mm-hmm. that word directly from the, the the sign that I'm looking at here right now. Which is a sign that was actually real. This is a story that you know we'll get into a little bit further. But the sign says there's three lights on it, and around the each light is a little plaque. The one uh, on the bottom left says this light f- uh, flashes every 16 seconds. Every 16 seconds, a person is born in the United States. Then there is one, one on the right that says this light flashes every seven and a half minutes. Every seven and a half minutes, a high grade person is born in the United States. Oh, wow. Wait, you won't believe where this came from. Wow. Um, and then it goes on to talk about, uh, you know, how great high-grade people are. And then at the top, there's a light that says, this light flashes every 15 seconds. Every 15 seconds, $100 of your money goes for the care of persons with bad heredity, such as the insane, feeble-minded criminals and other defectives. Uh, mm-hmm. And in the middle, it says, some people are born to be a burden on the rest. Uh, and and it, all this comes from uh, a story in uh, the Yale Alumni Magazine, where they talk about the role Yale had uh, in eugenics, and obviously mm. the Ivy League uh, throughout. And you know, Yale was not alone on this. Uh, but uh, you know, we talk about the Nazis who actually put this into practice, but it was it was put into practice because it had a large scientific background that was supposedly rock solid at the time. It was not Hitler. It was the progressives, the scientists, and the doctors that brought it to Hitler. Yeah, Hitler probably wanted to kill the Jews the whole whole time, obviously, but he got a scientific justification to do it. He brought people along on his journey because of that. Do you know who the first person was that says, maybe we can put all these defectives into a a gas chamber of some sort, some sort of a chamber, and we'll fill it with poison gas? I don't. George Bernard Shaw. Hmm. Well, yeah, because his thing, on menus. <laughs> his thing was, we don't want to hurt, we don't want to torture him, we don't want to make it bad for him, we just want to get rid of him. Yeah, if we, could just, kill, if we could just put them in a room and gas them and kill them quickly, then yeah, we'll, we'll just all humanely. be better. We'll do it humanely. Well, we're not talking about torturing them, we just want to get rid of mm-hmm. them. And people just don't, people don't put this all together, they don't see it, and then um, we forget it, um, and we don't see the roots of it again. Mm-hmm. You know, this is one reason why I fought so hard for uh, Terry Schiavo. Look, you, you can't, you don't have doctors make these calls. You don't have doctors make these calls. I'm sorry. The doctors don't know. And ever since that, you never saw these stories. But as soon as that story, as soon as that, as soon as she was dead and they killed her, Remember all the stories that came out and said people, you know, this person came out of a coma after X number of years. This person just came out oh, of a coma. Dozens, all the time. Yeah. Dozens mm-hmm. of them since. And all the doctors on all of those cases, they're dead. They're dead. Unplug, 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 unplug. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you want to be held responsible for that. But I believe all life, all life is sacred and all men are created equal. How can somebody actually say... Do you blame uh, uh, the president's eugenics or his uh, uh, or his uh, his genes, his DNA, for his crazy ideas? I don't. No, 
I mean, and look, you could do that. His parents, his father is from Kenya. He's a socialist Marxist. His grandfather was. His grandfather on his mother's side, his mother was. You could say that's a gene pool that made, that led him right to where he is. Not a gene pool. It's not even his upbringing. Those are all excuses. It's his conscience. It's his conscious choice. He makes a choice every day. And so do you. And so do I.